very nice to see so many people joining a presentation on a relatively narrowly focused topic, namely minimizing energy consumption in bare metal Kubernetes clusters. I'm David Miller Maroelli. I'm working for One and One Mail and Media, um, which is not immediately obvious what we are doing. Um, we are Germany's largest email provider with about uh, 40 million active customers. Um, I'm the lead architect for our infrastructure platform covering the entire life cycle of artifacts from the first line of code until running it in production in Kubernetes clusters. Um, along that way, I became sort of an expert for continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, and as you can see, I spent uh, quite a lot of time um, in IT by now. Um, so that's uh, my uh, history in a nutshell. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Marco. And yes, I'm getting old and doing IT operations since a while. Um, currently, I have the honor to lead a group of people, um, basically cloud engineers within the company, to provide the platform uh, based on Kubernetes that uh, David is, uh, has mentioned. So, but of course, yeah, this is not about me or us today. Um, I would like to start with a question, actually. So, uh, who of you in the audience is uh, doing bare metal Kubernetes? Wow. Okay, that surprises me a bit, uh, honestly. Um, but then, of course, you're in the right talk, and uh, maybe we have a chat afterwards, and we can uh, have a conversation about our challenges. Um, but today, the topic is basically energy savings in bare metal. So to give a bit more of context, David mentioned we are uh, the largest email provider in Germany, uh, over for 42 million active users, so that's quite a lot. Um, in the yesterday's keynote, I saw someone um, telling why they do cloud native, uh, because it accelerates their development, it helps growing the business, and this reminded me um, we had the same kind of journey five, six, seven years ago. So the company decided, okay, we break it, we break it down into microservices. And then it gets very, very uh, easily in the direction of having a container runtime. And so today we are doing a multi-tenant Kubernetes platform for our internal um, users on bare metal since uh, 2017, by the way. We do this on-premise. Why do we do it on-premise? The short answer is, yeah, because we can. Um, the bit longer answer is um, we have some uh, data protection constraints. We take, we take uh, security very um, serious. And um, also, um, Jonas, the company who operates the data centers for us, is also um, a member of the, the larger corporation that one on one mail and media, where we work, uh, is part of. Um, to, to give some numbers there on the slides, we have like uh, about 70,000 uh, CPU cores in our clusters. Uh, yeah, and uh, a lot of energy consumption. Uh, network ingress is like 600,000 requests per second. Just to give you an idea, this is, this is kind of huge. So this, li this slide should illustrate what's actually the problem with uh, having bare metal. So when you have your own servers in your data center, the scale out is not as easy as it is with public cloud. So you usually have too much hardware in the data center because um, this, this four step process that I um, have here is simplified, of course, and it, it should show what happens when we decide we need more hardware. Um, that, that's not, um, not a very, very easy thing. So we have to, to have budget constraints, we talk to the procurement department, they get vendor quotes, then the hardware arrives, there's logistics involved, racking, you know that. When you, do, when you have a data center, you know this. This takes time. This takes about, in our case, a few months until we have the boxes arrived and, and really um, available. And this, the fourth uh, step in, in, in this process here is the only step that we control, that my team actually controls, the, the Kubernetes node provisioning. So um, what this means in a simple sentence is we need enough spare capacity available in the data centers all the time. All right, 
Let's get everybody quickly on the same page. Why are we talking about the topic? Uh, well, it's trending anyway. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, save, uh, your car save CO2, reduce your carbon footprint, help save the planet. Um, that's, uh, that's the overarching story. Um, but then, particularly here in Europe, uh, you probably all know, for the last one and a half years, there's some kind of energy crisis due to the geopolitical events. Um, energy prices uh, skyrocketed and uh, wildly oscillate. I brought a, a little diagram on the bottom right that, that shows the German electricity prices over the last one and a half years. Uh, so that's so, sort of crazy. Um, so sa saving any amount of that saves you uh, varying amounts, but sizable amounts of money. Um, so that's all good, good incentives uh, to, to work on minimizing the energy consumption um, and not, and, and not on top of that, if you can uh, measure and quantify that uh, properly, that's a very good addition to the mandatory sustainability reports we need to publish, of course. Okay, let's uh, jump to a very um, quick and simple solution for minimizing the energy consumption, as the title says. No servers, no energy. Okay, thanks for being here. That clo oh, no. Okay, obviously there's uh, not only energy consumption, but things that um, need to be uh, fulfilled as boundary conditions, like providing compute power to our users. So um, let's quickly uh, start thinking about what we actually need to measure and what we can optimize um, based on these measures. So obviously only the uh, energy consumption is not, not the only thing. Um, so we need to measure the energy consumption with respect to various aspects. Um, I'll go into that uh, a little bit deeper in a moment, um, but let's first think about what KPIs need to do so we have a, a sort of recipe for constructing KPIs. So they obviously need to be reliable uh, and repeatable, so when I recalculate my KPIs from last year, I need to get the same results. Um, and uh, also they need to be robust against changes and any kind of dimensions that they are not related to. Um, like uh, when, uh, when my customer base grows, obviously I need more compute power, my energy consumption goes up, um, and then I could have an, a KPI that measures energy consumption per user maybe. Um, and so this is, the, this is the measure that's robust against, you know, business growth um, and shows if we get more efficient with respect to users. So that was just one example, and you see um, that opens the field for creating an entire set of KPIs um, that sort of illuminate various as aspects um, of your operations. Uh, and then if you're going as abstract as I just um, figured out, then uh, it, it's clear that a lot of assumptions need to go in and lots of um, simplifications to, to be able to do these abstract, more abstract KPIs. But of course, there's a lot of things that uh, are more basic and we can quickly have a look at what you can sort of do building up the stack of KPIs. The baseline for me is looking at the server idle power. Just wrecking a server, putting a power cord in there, switching it on, install Kubernetes, run no applications there, and then it will have some kind of idle consumption. I did actually a plot here. Uh, it's, a, it's a histogram of the idle consumption overall of our servers. Um, numbers are illegible by purpose, um, but I can tell you uh, that uh, the peak in the middle is uh, around 220 or so watts. Uh, so that's the average idle consumption of our servers. Um, and that gives you the opportunity to look into optimizing the various hardware components and config configurations of your servers and uh, tune them up to save a couple of watts times a thousand servers that adds up quickly. Okay, then um, idle servers are not very useful in the end. So let's step up uh, a little bit and put some load on it. Um, that would be the next KPI we propose. Um, to look at the server, uh, the server uh, uh, power consumption under load. 
So this opens up the, uh, the opportunity to optimize CPU settings, thermal tuning, um, because servers get hotter when they do more work, obviously. Um, and I brought a plot here too. Um, this is uh, power consumption on the y-axis uh, per CP average CPU load on the x-axis. Um, and the immediate thing that you will probably ask is, okay, why is there two groups of, uh, or two clouds of dots? Um, well, the, the left, uh, the, the upper left one, uh, that's the service with GPUs in there. So the work is not done in the CPUs, but other where, uh, at, a, at a different place. I, I don't have the metrics available yet for that. So, okay, the, the dependency uh, on CPU is a little bit different than the rest, uh, but you see, there's some kind of correlation in that lower uh, cloud of points um, that the energy consumption goes up and um, uh, with a growing load, which is uh, what we expect, of course. Uh, but then the, the immediate thing that you can ask is what, what other factors does that um, depend on, um, which brings me to a side topic of normalization. You probably have a mix of various CPU generations, various uh, CPU uh, models, uh, maybe even different brands uh, like this, you know, Intel, AMD, maybe ARMS, uh, all of them behave differently. You can tune the, the CPU clocks, all that kind of stuff has influence and we'll at some point uh, in the future, of course, need to disentangle that uh, to see not just, uh, you know, that huge blob, but a clearer co correlation. So that will certainly help you know, tuning the individual machine settings. One step up, look at the cluster performance. We all have clusters and so there's a, a, a huge or a large, uh, large group of servers interacting with each other. And there's you know, an inter interplay with, between them. And maybe uh, depending on the cluster tuning, the power consumption can be optimized. Maybe it, everything gets more efficient uh, when you distribute the load differently, like compacting the load of, on, on more servers and get a few more on idle mode or maybe spreading in evenly between all servers. Uh, we don't know yet, uh, but that's a question that's certainly worth answering and which has influence on scheduling on Kubernetes. Okay, and then um, at the last example, we can look at the applications. So, I mean, Load is a nice thing, but in the end, uh, it's the applications that generate the load. And so I'd really love to map power consumptions to individual applications um, uh, and maybe also calculate power per request uh, that, that's been processed in various applications. So that starts creating a bridge to the business view on our products. Um, so I can talk to business people uh, and help them make good decisions for the products and the development <clears throat> to minimize the energy consumption of the applications. Yeah, so that was a little bit of theory. Um, of course, there's projects that I learned about in this KubeCon, um, like uh, KEDA for uh, scheduling things, like Kepler and, uh, and other projects uh, for measuring and uh, uh, quantifying energy consumption. That's certainly something we'll put in and evaluate into our next steps. Um, but let's get away from theory a bit and look what we can do in practice um, and what, what can be measured with that kind of KPIs. All right, so um, let's move into a bit of concrete things that we did or did the, uh, things that we learned. So um, remember I talked about that we have always too much capacity available in the data center. Uh, when running bare metal. Um, I think it's important to understand what kind of reserves do we actually have. And when we made up our minds about the topic, we realized we have basically three types of reserves. We have scale-out reserves for growth of business, for example. We have um, geo-redundancy reserves and peak performance reserves. I go in, in all this uh, topics a bit more detail now. So scale-out reserves. Scale-out is basically, as I mentioned, growth in users, for example, which is great because in the end it pays my salary, so I like that. Um, but 
um, this is for future then. This is for future use. But essentially, it means maybe we can shut down some nodes now. So David said before, zero servers, zero bots. That's great. <laughs> no, it's not great. It would upset our users. They would uh, post terrible things on Twitter and on, on sites like downdetector.com and, and all those kind of things. Um, but how many servers can we actually shut down? And we identified what David said. Idle consumption is, most, is the, one of the most expensive kind of things. So um, we, we want to just power down machines that are not actually used. At le um, either they have zero usage or low usage. Um, because the whole specific infrastructure that you have in Kubernetes, like all these things that are up, up here, the kubelets and, and all the uh, daemon set kind of things, have uh, cons consume uh, load and energy in the end. So. One important question is, um, when we need the hardware, how fast can we re-enable them? And there we learned uh, that uh, automation as often is key. So the faster or the better automation we, we have, the, the longer we can wait activating hardware. And also what helped us in our setup is that we have, basically we have immutable infrastructure in our Kubernetes nodes. That means there is no SSH possible on the nodes. You cannot change anything there. Um, you can put the nodes in debug mode and change stuff, but then you have to redeploy them from scratch into a specific state. So those nodes are, yeah, there's no config drift. There's no puppet agent or anything. Um, and this, this, this helps because when we take a node freshly, it has the same state as all the other nodes in, in our clusters. Second uh, kind of reserve is uh, geo redundancy reserve. Uh, I think a bit context is important there. So we, the main Kubernetes clusters that we have for our workload is running in, in two different uh, regions within Germany, which is um, in an active, active manner. So we have no disaster recovery data center, which is doing nothing. We have uh, active, active. But what does, what does uh, this essentially mean is that both data centers um, have enough spare capacity that if one data center goes down, the other can take over the load. So we have not done that yet, so that's a plan for the future, but when we want to do that, this has some impact. So we need, we need better automation, faster automation, because when a data center breaks down, it, it's a matter of some minutes, and we want to be, we want to have this kind of uh, spare capacity available for the geo redundancy. So it's it's not an option to wait like half a day until all the servers are spin up. And so um, what's also important is the management ha has to have a, a buy-in there. We, we need to convince C-level management um, because there is a potential cost saving versus a potential risk, obviously. And um, what helps there is to create just transparency, trans uh, transparency about the risk, tr transparency with some KPI numbers that uh, David showed about, um, about the, the cost savings. So um, regarding the risk, what, what, what's also I, I think is important when you have all your operations team in the company is doing regular emergency drills for, for, for such a worst case scenario, um, this, ha this creates confidence in the operations teams and in the management. Okay, this graph is basically, so I said we are a mail provider, we have a usually daily curve, so this is two days of traffic uh, within our Kubernetes clusters. Uh, 600,000 requests, uh, uh, yeah. So um, during the night, obviously, there is no so, so much email traffic because people are not reading their mails so often. Um, what, what's, what, that's, what, what that means is that um, it would be cool if we can put some batch load that happens during the day for machine learning jobs, uh, for example, for in our data processing divisions, and, and do this batch processing not during the day on, on top of the usual user workload, but during the night, so we can flatten the curve a bit. That would be cool. Um, another thing is when we have, let's assume we have really low usage during the night, wouldn't it be cool to just shut down those servers then if, if they are not needed? Like for example, 11 p.m. shut down, 
a few hundred machines and uh, power them up in the morning, 7 a.m., when people wake up and read their emails. That would be really cool. But what this means, this, this even needs more automation because then, yeah, you, you, be, you have to be very fle flexible uh, in, the, in the hardware and uh, server management. All right, so um, another thing that we looked into is uh, HPA, the horizontal pod autoscaling. A few years ago, I thought this is only a thing for cloud providers or public cloud users because um, the hardware is there anyway. <laughs> but yeah, um, when, when workload is scaling down because uh, usage is low automatically, we, this would enable us really to shut down servers then in the end as a consequence. And also what's, uh, what we are looking into, that's the screenshot, is uh, it's actually the VPA recommender. Uh, VPA is, is a vertical pod autoscaler. It has a, a possibility to really automatically uh, adjust the, the resource requests within uh, the containers um, based on the current usage like for example the last 24 hours um, but we don't we don't want to do that we, we are a bit more conservative we want to use the recommender this this would help our users our tenants our the teams who are using kubernetes to see okay i requested for example eight cpus for my uh, application but i only need two so they would they have an incentive to help us save energy to uh, reduce the actual demand and we can maybe remove servers. All right, uh, this is interesting. So this is basically a thing that surprised me a lot. So uh, some uh, team members uh, did some investigations that our servers are really, I mean, I mean we have those uh, one rack unit Dell servers and uh, the fans are usually yeah, very, very fast spinning. And uh, we, we, we turned them down a bit, so spin lower. And this saved us about 15 watts per server. 15 watts, okay, it's not, not much, but with 1,000 nodes, it's actually 10 megawatt hours per month. So it, it's, a, it's quite a bit. This is just an example. Also, the small things matter, and it's really a quick win. All right, great. So, so we saw that uh, also in practice uh, me measures with different levels of complexity uh, can quickly save up a couple of megawatt hours per, per month or a couple of hundred maybe. Um, so as far as I understand, we are saving another, I don't know, 40 megawatt hours by just switching down the scale out, uh, switch, sorry, switching off the scale out reserve. Um, so that, that adds up. So it's really, really worth um, entering into that effort. Um, yeah. And for closing our session, I just want to have a quick look again at where we, where I want to want to go with uh, evolving that KPI and measurement and optimization scheme. Uh, as I mentioned, we can go as abstract with the KPIs as we want and look at um, applications, requests, users, products, product components. If we if we manage to map on that, uh, we have a, a link uh, between the operations focused stuff and the business and also the development. Um, and just imagine, that's, got, that's going a bit beyond the topic of that talk and it's very generic of course, but imagine that a developer could save 20 or even 50% of CPU cycles by just optimizing their algorithms, the implementation, that would immediately save you 20 or 50 or whatever kind of percentage of your infrastructure. That would be huge. So talk, talking to them and giving them the, the measures to, to optimize their stuff is definitely uh, a way to go. So creating that transparency will uh, most likely open um, huge opportunities. And uh, well, I, I took the opportunity today to talk a, a couple of, to talk to a couple of people from the tech uh, sustainability. Uh, here's a couple of men members. Uh, so I'm definitely looking forward uh, to getting connected to them and work together with them uh, to figure out um, what's the best way to go forward. And that leaves us, uh, as planned, fortunately, uh, quite some room for questions. So there's two microphones I learned. Um, so if you speak them in the microphone, we can hear you well, and the remote uh, participants can hear you just as well.
Hi, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you had a slide that showed uh, certain uh, kilowatts um, per service. I'm, I'm curious how you uh, calculated or measured uh, power usage per a service. Well, th thank you very much for that question. That's a pretty good one. Um, pr probably most of the people running bare metal servers uh, are familiar that, with, that, with the fact that most servers have a, bare, um, a baseband management controller and many of the servers have an internal measurement of, um, of their power consumption. Uh, that might not be a, you know, too precise, but it's a, it's a you know, relatively uh, good measure uh, if, if the server con consumes more power then that number goes up. Um, we are tapping into that and reading that every I think 30 seconds or so, so it's relatively fine-grained, so we get a total consumption of power. No. Uh, okay, uh, follow-up question, only one service per server? No, we are running, of course, the usual mixture that uh, Kubernetes loads on the servers, so mapping from a power consumption to uh, a sort of server-based power consumption to uh, an application-based power consumption will require some kind of, you know, additional measurements, some uh, kind of assumptions, sort of, you know, dividing up the total power consumption to the uh, various applications that we have the numbers actually available in Prometheus, like the CPU consumptions per application, per port, per any kind of thing. So we can use that as a proxy. But then I learned that Project Kepler is digging using eBPF into, uh, into the actual you know, CPU cycle counting and stuff like that. So dig, leveraging that uh, as well is, a, is, a, is an opportunity. We are certainly going to evaluate what's the easiest and quickest and most reliable way to do that. Okay, we have uh, another question here. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm curious, what do you use for provisioning the servers and cluster management? Very good question, thank you. Uh, so um, basically, um, we are having uh, the Flatcar container Linux as an operating system. And we have, um, I mean, we can, we can have a, a more detailed talk about all the details basically, but it's, um, a combination of the, the um, uh, CoreOS container Linux, me uh, Linux mechanism, like the Matchbox, and we have uh, our own company asset management uh, servers, and is it which kind of CPU and stuff? So there, there are uh, automatic uh, pipelines run, run by GitLab CI, who is then uh, um, configuring the servers. Um, yeah. Do you use something like Ironic or, or like OpenStack Ironic, I mean, or no? No, no, that's uh, also a good question. We, we, we're running really directly on bare metal. We have no virtualization layer. Uh, yeah, yeah, I Ironic can, can provision bare metal servers. So that, okay. Uh, okay. But, but you, you no, have something. No, no, we have our basically homegrown solution based on a, a bunch of scripts and uh, the tooling that uh, Container Linux provides. Okay, it would be very interesting to talk more. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so maybe very basic question here, but uh, the servers are very big, like 800 gigabytes of memory each, and there's kind of a limit of the amount of pods per node that you can put on a, on a Kubernetes. So how you handle that? Or are the pods very large? I mean, they all consume a lot of memory, or if you have a lot of microservices, how can you concentrate like thousands of pods in a bare metal server? Yeah, we have uh, some workload really consumes a lot of CPU cores. Mm. So, um, but uh, regarding the number of pods, um, the, co the colleagues, my colleagues can, can answer the question better, but I think we have a constraint about the uh, IP addresses uh, from Calico that we use as an SDN, uh, which is, I'm not sure if it's, is it uh, 20, 250? We, we enhance that, so I think we can run about 500 uh, pods per machine. Uh, so I have two questions. One is about uh, your power usage effectiveness. Do you have some numbers if you have 50% spare devices? And the other one is, have you tried to use other uh, CPU processor architectures, not only Intel, um, switch to ARM or something like this? Because this could be also promising with the same or more workload to consume uh, less uh, energy. So. Let me answer the second question first. Uh, so we, we looked into uh, other, as we, we didn't look into ARM, 
but we have basically a mixture between Intel and AMD CPUs. So the, the newest generation of, of servers that we use uh, are based on the a AMD Epic CPUs. And they are, so we measured more efficiency as well per, um, per core, or could, you could break it down into applications as well. So they are definitely more efficient. Um, what was the first question, sorry? Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, well, as Marco mentioned, uh, the data centers are not fully under our control. They are operated by the colleagues of IONOS. Um, so I, I can't probably answer the questions related to them. We are in contact, but they are running the data centers. Uh, I don't have the numbers in the top of my head. Um, but of course, they are also optimizing the data center setup as good as they can. Um, we, we have, for example, had uh, discussions about the terminal setup, uh, you know, rising the data center temperature, reduces cooling um, uh, requirements, stuff like that. that that's being done. Um, but, you know, our work starts when nobody needs to touch a screwdriver ag again. <laughs> One uh, silly question, but <laughs> I know you have lots of span and it's still um, uh, exploding. So how much energy do you uh, spend for <laughs> cleaning the spam? <laughs> So you saw the, the, the spikes in the, in, in, the, in the daily variation graph that I showed? Yeah, that's because spammers like, uh, spammers seem to use cron, hourly cron. Uh, yeah, I cannot really say how much this, what this exactly means in kilowatt or megawatt or whatever, uh, but uh, I would say it's a lot. Um, we, we are not so far regarding the KPIs that David showed. This is in a, in a, in a phase where we, spend a lot of thinking about measuring, but we, we don't have like, today we don't have this metric available. I cannot say this spam filter application is uh, causing this amount of energy. We hope we can maybe in the, in the next KubeCon next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's certainly the goal. And well, g giving a rough guesstimate, it's a, it's a low three digit number of megawatt hours per, per month to, to filter out the spam. Um, but, you know, may, maybe next year we can tell a little bit more and with more precise numbers. Okay, next question would be that side. <laughs> Hi, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you touched upon some great subjects here and I'm really happy to discuss them further with you in the tag, environmental sustainability tag that is. And uh, I just want to pick one of these uh, sub subjects, which was the fan speed, um, which you reduced. Um, did you also measure how much that increased the temperature um, on, on, on the chips and how that affected the lifespan of the devices? Very good question, thank you. Um, yes, we did. We did measure that. I don't have the concrete numbers on top of my head right now, but okay, my colleague is also not having it. I have had a look. Um, we have a Grafana dashboard. We can have a look later if you want, um, but definitely it didn't decrease or um, uh, worsen the, the lifespan of the, of the chips or of the server or something. Um, we can compare a bit. Our, our data center provider increased the room temperature in the data center from, I don't know the exact numbers, but they increased some, some uh, um, uh, degrees centigrade and it didn't affect too much anything. So it's, it's basically the same. You, 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 you don't run your data center at 16 degrees centigrade anymore today. 23 or so is fine. That's really interesting because I just read an article about that and yeah, I'd love to hear more about it on the tag, maybe so, we'll meet yeah. up. So short answer is we, did, we didn't see a correlation on uh, lifetime of, of servers okay. because of Cool, that. thank you very much. Hi, um, I just wanted to piggyback off of an earlier question um, regarding pod density. I just wondered if you guys, the basic question, had any issues with um, storage IO performance? and running lots of pods at once on those big nodes? Short answer, no, no not yet. Um, long answer, most of our microservices are actually stateless, so they essentially get, get fed their data by uh, network streams and they reply by network streams. Um, and we have the service equipped with uh, 10 gigabit per node and newer nodes with more CPU cores with 25 gigabits uh, and an option to double that, so we are safe on that side up to now. Um, we have a couple of applications that are accessing remote storage, so that's not supposed to be super fast anyway, um, and they seem to be happy with what they get. Um, yeah. 
uh, as a side remark, we, we n probably never will put the real big storage uh, requirement uh, application like you know the email store or the cloud file storage on Kubernetes that doesn't make sense in the multi tens of petabyte uh, range. So we're doing that on bare metal uh, by themselves, and that's uh, the, the same way to go anyway. Okay, um, we are probably very close to the end. Um, Maybe one question left. Yeah. Maybe one last question. We'll stay. We'll stick around the entrance area so you can have a chat with us afterwards if you like. So the question is on the uh, energy consumption of the network. Is this factored in? How much do you have any estimates, and how can you measure that? If this is sometimes external to the actual machines. That's so, such an excellent question. I had exactly the same discuss, uh, discussion with David a couple of days ago. And the short answer is, unfortunately, we don't have these numbers because the network operations as well is not within our direct influence. It's, not, it's in the same company that provides the data center. And um, yeah, we don't have, we, we just have not the technology right now to combine those kind of numbers. But my personal goal would be to get there and to, to be able to do that as well, because it, does, it only makes sense if we have the full picture from the hardware network up to the application and the, the algorithm efficiency. Yeah? You need everything. Thank you.